Ah, right. I was looking for my slide. Ah. <laughs> what happens? Yeah. Right. So, 50 years um, since man first went into space. And in those 50 years, 500 people have been into space. You could fit them all inside this room. And as much as a lot of things have been achieved, I think that just shows you the measure of how much further we've got to go. What we're trying to do in Virgin Galactic, and what I'm going to talk about in this presentation, is to get 500 more people into space in one year. And in the space of 10 years, get 30 to 40,000 people into space. So it's quite an undertaking for a company like Virgin. And I'll talk a bit about Virgin, you know, who we are, why we got into this business. I'll talk about the main challenges involved in this project, where we've got to. And then the other thing I'll talk a bit about, particularly with you know, the design conference in mind, is how we've put the customer experience at the center of the design, particularly for the spaceship. I mean, it applies to other elements of the project as well. And you know, I, I think these two quotes here just illustrate some of people's feelings from the very first days. You know, there, were, there were engineering endeavors, there were scientific endeavors, of course they were. But emotion and feeling came into it straight away. You know, I'd love it if you could experience this. And a lot of people grew up in the 60s thinking, you know, as, as you know, President Kennedy said, we'll put a man on the moon as the Russians move forward with their space program. A lot of people grew up in the 60s and 70s thinking, well, I'm going to do that as well. And then it, you know, it didn't really happen. Now, that's why we've come, because you know, that's what we're going to try and do. So just to put a formal title on it, it, you know, it's about designing a spaceship for everybody, basically. So first of all, what is Virgin Galactic? Who are Virgin? Well, a little different maybe to some c companies that are involved in space, involved in engineering. We're, we're a branded venture capital organization, which means that we incubate projects, we put investment into projects that we believe in. We sometimes see industries that are poorly served, and we think that there's a, there's a gap there in the market, be it in airlines with Virgin Atlantic, where we thought British Airways are either so busy, you know, carrying people, there must be space for us in the market, or when they didn't answer their phone, so, it, so inefficient maybe that, you know, we should get in there and offer some customer service. So we started with one aircraft in Virgin Atlantic, and we built up a fleet. Some of these businesses have started in a different way. We took over an organization that existed and put a Virgin brand onto it and introduced Virgin values into the organization. So one of the things that we did with Virgin Atlantic is we sponsored this aircraft which flew around the world on one tank of fuel a few years ago. And that got us working with an organization in California called Scale Composites and a guy called Bert Rutan who was heading the organization at the time. And they built this aircraft and we went to see it and we got to know Rutan and got to know the organization. And we found out that in the States, a prize had been set up, inspired by early aviation prizes. People thinking, well, you know, if that worked for aviation, if that stimulated people to do things that they wouldn't have done otherwise, even if they're going for a prize of £10,000, $25,000, a huge amount more is going to be stimulated and spent to win that prize. And thus it proved, and thus it proved with this thing that was called the XPRIZE. The XPRIZE was set up. It had to be privately funded spacecraft. It had to fly two times in a two-week period and get into space both times. And if you did that, you won the $10 million prize. And it was estimated that about $125 million was spent by the various teams trying to win that prize. So in terms of leveraging, you know, it certainly had a, an effect. Bert Rutan's idea was not new. It was to take an idea that had been used many years before in the X-15 development program and have a carrier aircraft carry the spaceship up. There's the spaceship, X-15. That's what it looks like when it's flying solo. Now, the big challenge for Bert was thinking, well, smooth spaceships, you know, you, you only have to look at the space shuttle to see. Smooth spaceships, Coming back down to the Earth very quickly, big heat buildup. You know, we know about bullets. If you try and pick up a bullet after it's been fired, it's very hot. They move very fast, very smooth, lots of heat. Graphics by Virgin. Um, feathers, on the other hand, lots of resistance, fall much slower. 
So he was thinking, and he was also thinking about shuttlecocks, and he's, he's, his mind just turned, well, shuttlecocks always fall down, don't they? Always fall the right way. And this made him think, right, I am going to design a spaceship that can reconfigure itself when it's in the air, so the back half folds up. When that falls back down, there will be a lot more drag. It'll fall slower. The heat buildup will be slower, and the people inside will be safer. And then when it gets to a certain altitude, it will reconfigure and land like a glider on a conventional runway. And I'll show you some moving pictures if, if my explanation wasn't, wasn't clear in a few moments. So that was his breakthrough idea. So in terms of the two main design ideas here on this project, just working out how he was going to do that problem, have a reusable spaceship, not spend millions and millions and millions of dollars achieving that, that was his breakthrough idea. It's a two-stage system that he came up with. The mothership, the carrier aircraft, White Knight, is above, and it carries Spaceship One. So just to illustrate what I've just been talking about, I'll show you a short film. This is the point that we came in. This is the point that we started sponsoring the project. And this is also the point that we started thinking, that's a pretty raw experience. Uh, and in terms of you know, selling that as a customer experience and expecting people to be able to cope with that, to, to be able to sustain the G-forces, um, we're going to have to do something about that. So bear in mind, this is, this is what they did in 2004 to win the prize, but it was also the jumping off point for how we could make it much more customer friendly. So here we are in Mojave, California, which is where the project was done. Take off early morning, carrier aircraft carrying the spaceship. The, both vehicles were flown by one pilot. This is the release point, so this is the spaceship being released. It has a, a rocket motor inside it, which is fired, and it, it burns for about 40 seconds. At the altitude where it's released is about 15 kilometers altitude, about 50,000 feet. So the rocket motor's off. This is where the feathering takes place, this, this folding uh, action. This is where the weightlessness happens. He lets go of the camera at one point, and it just stays there. He didn't do it for this shot. And this is you know, certainly one of the, the, the places in the, in the mission where you, know, peop you can see the opportunity for enjoyment. You can see the opportunity for excitement. And that was one of the points that really got us excited about this project. <laughs> and then we get to the stage where it folds back, sustaining quite a large number of Gs at this point, moving a lot faster than it looks, but a lot slower than it would otherwise. And it's a glider. And it, it com comes back to the runway at Mojave, 10,000 foot runway, conventional landing. OK, so as I say, we seized the opportunity. We, we got involved in, in it th at that point. And that was the point where we put together our sort of first business plan to, to think about whether the amount of money that we'd have to put into this could ever work. And we set ourselves up, announced that we were doing this, safe, commercially viable, this access to space is what we're about for people, for payload for science, if that was possible, but certainly starting with suborbital tourism. That's the starting point. Now, because I want to get to how we've thought about the launch system, I'm going to go through the main challenges fairly quickly. Um, I'm happy to talk about them in the question session at the end. Two things, really, I would say about it. One, one is that the X Prize was to fly twice in a two-week period, and that's it. And the spaceship is hanging on the roof of the Smithsonian. Our project was about producing something that could fly on a regular basis, and we could make a commercial return out of. So that really did point us in some quite different directions as far as the drivers. 
for the design, for the thinking about the customer experience. And the other thing, it was, it was not like John Kennedy saying, we're going to put a man on the moon. It was Richard saying, I'm going to be on the first flight. So that certainly, you know, it, in terms of us being on the minus one flight probably, or the minus two flight, just to make sure it's okay, that certainly made it very clear that this is not a theoretical exercise. This is going to happen to us, this group of people, and you have got to be sure that it's as safe as possible and as enjoyable as possible, you know, those other dimensions as well. Otherwise, you know, there's going to be a problem. Now, we, just, we surveyed our customers at that point, and they told us the, the things that they were mainly interested in, and we sort of knew what they were going to be. We didn't really know the order at that stage. Number one, they wanted to see the planet. Number two, they wanted the weightless experience. Number three, they wanted to see the opportunity of the black sky. And number four, the ride. You know, it was going to be a thrill. From our point of view, that was one of the ones where we're thinking, well, are people going to be able to cope with it? So we scaled up the design of the spaceship. It's designed uh, to carry six passengers. This was the point, really, where we thought about how much we would need to charge, how much we'd need to invest in the project, but also how much we'd need to charge to make a return. And we pitched the price quite quickly. It was quite a rough calculation at $200,000 per flight. Now, what that enabled us to do quite quickly was start thinking, start fielding calls, fielding the interest of people saying, at last, somebody's going to do this, I want to go to space. And we started signing people up and taking deposits. And we've now got to the stage where 450 people have signed up um, at deposit levels, which vary, but the total it comes to about um, $57 million at the moment, which um, uh, is, is in an in account. We haven't used that to fund the project. It also identified to us very early on that customer retention would need to be something that we'd have to think quite carefully about, partly because um, we wanted people to stay invested, you know, interested in the project and, and see it develop, but also because we didn't want Virgin to be worried about people signing up and then dropping out again because that would not give them the strong feeling that they would need to carry on investing in the project. And I, as I said, the ride was the other thing that we really thought about. And we, we programmed a centrifuge at that point and used Richard as the guinea pig, as you can see, um, but also invited our first 100 people who'd made a reservation to go on the centrifuge. It was programmed to the G profile of the spaceship. And it proved, really, that 95% of people could cope with that quite admirably. And that was a lot higher a percentage than we thought. We realized that we weren't going to be able to fund this, so we found an equity partner. Arbar Investments signed up for $280 million in 2009. We also uh, talked to various states in, in the in United States. Um, this is a project that's being developed in Mojave. It's a project that's going to operate to start with in New Mexico. And New Mexico seemed the best option for us. It's high altitude, the, the, spaceship, uh, the spaceport site. It's, it's 4,000 feet. They've got good weather a lot of the year. It's right next to White Sands Missile Range, which means it's got clear airspace to infinity, really. And more to the point also, maybe, is that they were, were a willing partner. They had funds that they wanted to invest in something to stimulate the economy of southern New Mexico. And a spaceport fit the bill as far as they were concerned. So they held a design competition. It was run by Fosters and Partners of London. They've designed it to support the, the spaceflight experience. It's nearly completed now. It's a, it's a gold lead building, and uh, it, it will be finished before the end of this year. Now, this could be a presentation all in itself, actually, the regulatory compliance side of the project. But in terms of challenges, the export control nature of this project, getting the operator's license from the FAA, and working out how best to cover the informed consent side of the project uh, and tell people about the risks, but also make sure, you know, understanding what they're taking on, that they do sign up to informed consent is something that we will need to work our way through. And, you know, there are models in adventure sports, you know, in, in medicine, lots of models that we've been looking at. And it's, it's a project that we're certainly not doing by ourselves. You know, there are a lot of partners and stakeholders in this. We've had to build the culture of these different organizations. We've had to work with these organizations to make sure that we've got common objectives and that we succeed together. 
and that, you know, the collaboration there has been a very important part of the project. Uh, lots of interfaces to, to deal with. Okay, main part of the rest of what I'm going to say is about the, the spaceship. Um, how have we developed the spaceship? But more to the point, really, how have our customers' requirements influenced our engineering decisions? A reminder, those were the four things that they told us they were looking for. So we clearly needed to scale this thing up. It, it was not big enough. You could see there was one pilot in it. We needed a passenger cabin. We looked at building, you know, just scaling everything up and, and building it the same configuration. But that brought problems that we didn't think, f you know, from our airline experience, our airline heritage, we would be able to overcome. For example, the, the access into the carrier aircraft would be way up in the ground. The engines for the carrier aircraft would be way up in the air, difficult to maintain, special equipment needed. So that was rejected pretty quickly. And what we ended up with was this configuration, which probably looks a lot more like an airline than a spaceship, you know, an airline aircraft than a spaceship. Um, but does achieve you know, things like the, low, the, the relatively low slung engines, easy for mainten maintenance, easy access. And it, it produced a couple of other benefits that I'll talk about as well. And that's what it looks like on the ground. Now, because we designed it to carry the spaceship, and, and we'd now got this se section where the spaceship would be, we were able to put spoiler flaps in there so that we could generate drag so that it simulated flying the spaceship. And so you can train the spaceship pilots on the carrier aircraft without consuming lots of spaceship time, which is very useful. And the other thing is that it gave us, I'll just let you see this. The other thing is it gave us an extra cabin. So we can think about maybe using that as part of the passenger training um, part of the project, part of the service. Uh, we had to do other things like change the wing position because that certainly had a big effect on the stability so you don't get that shaking that um, Brian was experiencing in the, in the earlier film. Much bigger vehicle with this cabin, bigger diameter, a lot more space inside. And we're going to fit it out. We're doing, doing this at the moment, and we're not ready to reveal what this looks like at the moment. But this is just some concept um, of the interior, a sort of two-position seat. Partly because the G forces on the way up and the way down are different and in different directions, and it, therefore to sit in a different position allows you to cope with that. But also so that with there's space for people to float around in the cabin. And the windows, a lot more windows and better place, better place for the crew and better place for the passengers as well. An early decision, again with the airline in mind, was to have it two pilots, not one pilot. And also really, if possible, to, to make it so that experienced airline pilots could fly it and not specialist test pilots like Brian Binney, because there are a lot more you know, experienced airline pilots around than there are test pilots. We also had to think a lot more, and again, a whole other presentation on the, 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 the sort of reliability, availability, maintainability side of things. And so there was a lot more thinking there went into the design of Spaceship Two than there was in the original Spaceship. Um, this is some testing that we did before we dropped the Spaceship. Uh, it was flying over the new spaceport in, in uh, New Mexico. And I'm going to finish by talking about what the future holds for the organization. Um, sub suborbital tourism has got to work for us. You know, that's the launching point for everything else, quite literally. But if that works, um, we are possibly going to see, and partly because of the shuttle um, program ending that Steve talked about, we're going to see other opportunities come our way, I'm sure. We won last week um, a NASA uh, contract um, to carry science research. And there are quite a number of organizations talking to us now about whether we could fly their vehicle and be the launch platform for their vehicle. So you could see over the years developing, you know, from space tourism, from using these vehicles, a science service and also a payload launch service. And potentially, you know, A to B, point to point travel. Uh, you know, there's a lot more to be done with this system before that would, that would be a possibility. But certainly if, you, if you're making those other steps, you know, that's possible. But none of that will happen unless we achieve these three milestones that are the most immediate ones. We've got to get to powered flight of the spaceship. 
We've got to get to space flight, and then we've got to start operations. So just to finish off, I'll just show you some of the testing that we've been doing. Um, this is the rocket motor, the ground testing. So obviously you'd want to be sitting in front of that, not behind it. Uh, and I'm just going to finish off by showing you, I think you know, certainly encapsulates all the sort of attributes of an engineer, a film that just from quite recently when we did the first, fe first feather test on the spaceship. So we, knew, we know this works on spaceship one, and, but it only did it a relatively small amount of time. So it's had to be scaled up. We've used some new components for reliability reasons. You know, does it work? We're going to drop our spaceship. We're going to drop our $25 million asset. You know, what's going to happen? So this is, this is what happened. And we've carried on doing some more. So uh, I've got the yellow card. I've actually finished. <laughs> um, so that's it. Thanks very much. I mean, we're confident of success in the program. Uh, you know, we've got quite a few uh, things still to do on it. Look for, pe uh, look for powered flight next year. And if that goes well, then we should really be moving towards commercial service. Thank you very much for your attention. Happy to answer any questions.